Hey everyone, we're back with another episode of the Edge Podcast for CHROs. My name is Varun. I have my co-host Nisha, and tonight's our guest is Andrew Gopran. Uh, I'll give I'll give his introduction in a moment, but let me quickly brief you through what the journey's been like so far. Uh, me and Nisha have recorded three episodes with uh, Bhagyashree, with uh, Dr. Sana, and with Dr. with with Rajiv as well. All the three episodes have sort of covered different aspects of what the future work would look like. The first one we covered what tax and compliance would look like in different geographies, given that all companies are now looking for a borderless workforce. And we also covered the nuances between uh, the difference between work from anywhere, work from home, and work from uh, and work from uh, you know uh, work from anywhere, work from home. And uh, what was the what was the other thing, Nisha? I'm this is so okay. confusing to me as well. I can just imagine how confusing it might be to somebody from else. The office, well. Working from the office, Varun. <laughs> like all well, of correct. us have. <laughs> yeah. See, so you can imagine, right? How so the, the these are all lines in sand, essentially, right? So you know, we so we had and Bhagat really helped us to re, so you know really draw the lines between all of these three things and help us understand. Hey, this is what entails in terms of work from anywhere. This is what happens in when you work from office. This is what happens when you work from home, right? And they're three, three different things. So you see how confusing that was for me itself. The second episode was with uh, Dr. Sana. So we, uh, I think, all of us, we had a pretty interesting conversation with Dr. Sana, wherein we dealt essentially with the behavioral shifts that have been happening with employees, with employers uh, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now, and what it could probably look like after the pandemic as well. And I think that's an important uh, thing to sort of factor in because one that doesn't cost anybody money, but if you implement the philosophies that we mentioned in the podcast, it could really uplift a lot of things in terms of NPS, in terms of employee productivity, and a bunch of those things. The third episode with Rajiv uh, was a very interesting episode again as well. Then we'd covered a lot of things on what payroll would look like, and a lot of things around what uh, you know the future of CHROs might look like in different organizations, different sizes, right? How might how might they operate in such ambiguity and all of these things? So Rajiv presented some very interesting playbooks that will of course uh, be sharing with you in terms via newsletter, and you can keep checking out our LinkedIn page as well. Uh, so let me quickly give you a quick intro of Andrew. Uh, Nisha, and then probably we can, and then you can also give, uh, you know, a quick note or two about Andrew as well, and then we can start. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, so Andrew Gobran is from Minnesota. Uh, he's actually joining us. He's our very first guest, in fact, from, uh, you know, the states. So it's been pretty exciting to actually talk to him uh, before this as well. Uh, so Andrew is a people uh, operations generalist based out of Minnesota for the last three years. Uh, he's been at Doist, a fully distributed team of 90 people living in 33 countries that creates tools that promote more fulfilling ways to work and live. At Doist, he's towards various processes and touch points across the entire employee experience and helps them develop an organizational culture where people can thrive and perform at their natural best. In fact, this is what a podcast tonight is going to be focused on as well too, primarily on the onboarding aspects of what it's going to look like. Uh, because I mean, come on, you guys have 90 people working across in 33 countries. That's that's a huge achievement. That's something that people dream of even today, despite remote being a very, uh, you know, business as usual thing at the moment. And I think the feed that you've achieved is something that is definitely worth, uh, you know, to be spoken about. So we'll get deeper into that later. Uh, Nisha, you, would you like to add a couple of words about Andrew? Well, I just want to say thanks to Andrew. I know uh, we've been, you know, chatting for some time and we've kind of, it's taken a while to schedule this. So thank you really. I, I mean, I'm really happy that we're finally recording. So, and also welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, it's wonderful to be here. Great. And would you like to uh, talk a bit over experience and what you'd like to share tonight? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, our, our, our conversation today is uh, focused on, on remote first work and um, particularly how to, to kind of, um, you know, how to develop that and what that actually looks like, uh, especially in the past year with the pandemic. I think a lot of, um, a lot of companies were kind of forced into the space of having to figure out what that means for them, how to manage that. Um, what that means for culture and for different, um, you know, their different practices and uh, how to, you know, what to do moving forward. Uh, and, you know, I, I, you, we've seen a lot of different examples of companies that have um, really stepped up to the plate and have um, found a great way of doing that. Others that are, are struggling and, you know, and, and, and some that just don't know, um, you know, what to do moving forward. So. Uh, I think it's a, a great chance to kind of talk about what that looks like and, you know, and, and 
you know, I, I'm excited to share some of what we've done at Duis just as a, um, a fully remote company and, and having been that way since our, our start. Right, that's, that's pretty exciting. So, you know, the one, one of the very first things that sort of uh, made me curious about all of these things, right, about how you've been able to hire 90 people across so many countries is that, I mean, this is something that I think every company uh, faces one of their first challenges, which is onboarding, right? So what I believe is that the first 90 days of anybody, right, be it at any level, any person, uh, the first 90 days is super crucial for them to sort of prove their metal because you look at any country in the world, any person in the world, uh, you look at the president of the United States, you look at the prime minister of India, you look at anybody, right? They've got 90 days, I mean, sorry, 100 days actually to prove their metal to really show if their government is worth this also worth or not. And the first 100 days are super crucial that way. Similarly, a quarter is that crucial for every company, for every org in terms of culture, in terms of what this person might be able to do with the company and how the company might be able to also help them going down the line, right? So success or failure during the first few months, 90 days, a predictor of overall success uh, or failure of the job, right? This is how I'd like to sum up. Uh, the thing. So how does your organization, how does Doist help transition new hires or even existing ones that have been promoted, for example, to the break-even point? And by break-even point, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to refer to is that, hey, you know, there's a learning curve to get back to certain expected normalcy and how do you get them the quickest there and from there to the next, uh, you know, thing? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a huge question. Um, that is, yeah. The, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I think up front, one of the biggest things is to really personalize the experience. Um, I think today there's, um, you know, in an effort to be more efficient or, um, you know, to, to minimize work or whatever, there's, you know, a lot of automation, a lot of kind of generic practices that are done. And, and of course, sometimes those have their place. But uh, I think especially with onboarding, when you're talking about um, you know, really getting people aligned with, with the company, um, helping them acclimate to the way things are done and um, to really help them see themselves in the company. Um, I think that requires a lot of personal touches and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of very specially catered um, practices. Um, so I think that's kind of the lens that we start with um, at Duist at least, um, is thinking about what each individual person needs and um, and how we can cater the whole experience to, um, to really help set them up for success. Um, so for us, that starts with um, a mentoring program. So each person who joins um, is assigned to a mentor and, and that person um, becomes kind of their go-to person on a, on a day-to-day -day basis for, um, for questions, for helping them um, learn how to navigate work on their team um, how to navigate different uh, interactions within the company. Um, and, and that's kind of their, uh, um, their, their uh, you know, their, their kind of uh, go-to person anytime they need something. So um, especially when you're remote, um, you know, I remember my first day at Duist and um, I logged onto my computer onto our, you know, we use Twist, which is one of our, our communication tools. Um, and, and I logged onto Twist and I was like, all right, <laughs> here I am. This is my first day of work. Um, so to have that person that, you know, okay, if I need anything, I can go to them. Um, and they're specifically there to help me um, is a, a very big first step. Um, second thing um, is having kind of an idea of, of what they need to do once they've, they've started. Um, so one of the things that we've done that was done back when I joined and we've continued building on um, is uh, developing an onboarding project um, on Todoist, which is one of our, um, is our other tool, it's our productivity app. Um, and, and each person gets a project that's designed for them. Um, it includes, um, you know, accounts they need to set up, things to read, um, uh, you know, different people to connect with, you know, within the first couple of weeks or so. Um, and it's kind of my way of, of giving them a tour around the company. Um, so while I can't, you know, walk them through the halls and, you know, knock on people's doors and introduce them, I can um, kind of use this as a virtual tour of sorts to, um, to walk them around, you know, like this is, you know, here's this tool and this is what we use it for. Um, you know, here's this guide um, about, you know, you know, how we submit 
invoices each month for, for payments um, and walking them through those things virtually. Um, and that allows them then to um, go through those things at their own pace. Um, so it gives them the freedom to kind of, you know, to decide, okay, I'm, you know, I feel like I can take a lot more information on right now. So I'm going to dive into this guide or, or this documentation. Um, but at the same time, if they don't feel like, you know, okay, maybe they've absorbed a lot in that day, um, they don't have to feel pressured to, you know, to have information forced down their throat, basically, um, which is uh, also very important early on when, um, you know, when people are, are kind of um, getting flooded with information and with introductions and, and a lot of different things. Um, and then on a, on a practical standpoint, then like the actual work, um, you know, early on, we try to get people involved in smaller tasks and projects that um, help them kind of get a sense of, of what the different, um, you know, communication norms are, um, the different routines around different work, um, and that um, kind of gives them a chance to ease into that process so that, um, you know, we're, they're both able to like, get comfortable with it, but we're also able to, um, to kind of give them specific feedback as they go um, to help them kind of adjust and, and correct any like early misalignments. Um, and when you combine all of those things, just with the feedback loops um, between mentors, managers, um, you know, it really makes for a personal experience that each person has and um, that's catered towards their needs. So um, naturally you'll find some people um, acclimate very quickly and, and they're able to really jump into more complex projects. Um, you know, others might need a bit more time to get used to that and um, experience also plays a part. So um, yeah, it's uh, very personal. It's, um, you know, it, it's difficult to tell people that sometimes because they want, you know, a process that is um, e easy to replicate, easy to execute. and. Um, and when you're talking about, you know, investing in people that are, you know, going to be part of your company, hopefully for the long term, uh, the only way to do it is is to make it personal. That makes a lot of sense, especially so two things really stood out to me. One was the fact that, hey, you guys immediately assign mentors. So one, so I'm trying to understand one thing here, right? How do you assign mentors? What do you, what makes you so sure that, hey, this person might be the right person for this? Because essentially you're trying to, uh, you know, mesh people into this uh, partnership sort of thing because they're going to be there with them until the probation ends or I don't know how long the duration of the mentor of the mentor and mentee is, right? That's one thing. The second thing is uh, in terms of, uh, I think you mentioned about, uh, uh, about uh, you know, feedback loops as well, right? About the feedback loops essentially being personal. I really like the point. I think that makes a lot of sense. But in terms of, uh, you know, quickly identifying red flags for the company, about the certain person, about this, you know, the two-way street there. How do you, again, what's your process? Could you like dive, could you give us a more granular view about what the feedback loop is like for let's say an engineering team or a product team or a marketing team, for example. Uh, so yeah, these are my two follow-up questions to that. Yeah, um, so the mentor selection is pretty simple. Um, I mean, you know, as a 90 person team, you know, that doesn't make for a lot of, you know, like the resources can be pretty limited, but, um, whenever we have someone joining, typically the mentor is someone who's on their team who can um, help inform like the role specific work that, you know, like I, for example, would never be able to help them with. Um, so that's really what we focus on is who can can really help guide from a like a role specific standpoint. Um, and then in terms of culture, of course, which is, you know, the other big aspect. Um, you know, typically mentors have been with the company for about a year, so they've had time to also, um, you know, they understand the culture, they understand how things work. Um, and then, but beyond that, of course, um, as a company, we kind of set this expectation that um, everyone is a resource when needed. Um, and everyone really like takes ownership for that. So, you know, of course, for myself being in, in people operations, I'm kind of, uh, the de facto, you know, culture guide when, when people are joining, like if they have questions about, you know, how this works or why we do this or, 
um, whatever it might be, I'm kind of the default, um, you know, me or someone else from people ops is, um, is the default, um, you know, support there. But, um, but in general, just, you know, establishing a culture where um, everyone is encouraged to help when, when asked or when needed or when they see something, um, you know, to be willing to step in and, and provide that support. Um, and, and I think that makes a big difference because um, it, it helps the team remember like, hey, like, um, you know, this person's success isn't only dependent on their manager and their mentor and, and people ops. Like it's um, as a team, we're here to support everyone. Um, you know, and, and our, our successes, our successes and failures are, are collective, like it's not, um, you know, like individualized. So, um, so I think that makes a big difference. Um, as for the feedback loop and how that typically works um, with, uh, you know, each person meets with their manager at least once a month um, during their, you know, I, I know you asked about the probationary period and we have a, a yeah. trial period is what right. we call it um and and for us it is three months so um it is kind of for that first you know three month period where um you know there's going to be a lot of learning a lot of um experimenting and a lot of just getting comfortable with everything um and typically within that time frame um we're able to tell like okay this person um you know there's an upward trend in terms of their performance in terms of their responsiveness to, to constructive feedback. Um, you know, there's nothing like critically misaligned that um, that hasn't been addressed and, and that hasn't been corrected. Um, and so that feedback loop typically looks like, um, you know, with them with their manager that happens at least on a monthly basis, but you know, early on it happens more like on a weekly basis. Um, and then with the manager, it happens pretty regularly, um, like on a day-to-day -day basis or at least a weekly basis, um, where they're at least connecting to kind of debrief on the past week, um, you know, talk about what went well, what didn't go well, um, you know, and just to, to talk about any challenges that are, are being faced. Um, and then, of course, each mentor and manager is kind of in communication about um, okay, like let's, you know, if there's anything that um, needs more attention, they kind of align on, on making sure they're supporting on that front. Um, and, and so they're kind of both in the loop on what's going well and what's not. Um, so that way, by the time you reach the end, the end of those three months, you can, um, you know, there really aren't any surprises in terms of, you know, like whether that person has been doing well or not, because um, they've kind of been in this continuous feedback loop already. So, um, you know, if there are any critical, um, critical issues, they've been brought to light and, um, and, and, you know, the manager and mentor have worked with that person to, um, to kind of address that and to, to kind of come up with a plan of, of what needs to be changed or, um, how they can support kind of getting that person to the point they need to be. Um, it's very interesting. So uh, let's let's dive a little bit deeper into this particular aspect, right? So, uh, so every company sort of has a different culture set for themselves in terms of how they work, in terms of how they communicate and all of these things, right? So I personally believe that culture and virtues are very synonymous, like they're the same things, um, two sides of the same coin, and virtues are essentially a set of actions. Um, <clears throat> to give you like a little history of this entire virtue thing, right? Uh, the samurais basically, you know, the actual warriors of Japan, um, they had, you know, they were very virtuous people. They had a certain, you know, set of virtues that they had to really follow, like the Ten Commandments. It was that serious to them, right? It was almost like religion, right? And that's one of the only standing reasons I think that the, the, the samurai lasted for over seven centuries and dominated the same, you know, uh, you know, the, the space that they were in. And, and, and if I were to extract that, you know, the same, uh, philosophy to companies and to organizations, right, of all scales. I feel that every company sort of operates in a certain virtuous manner and that, that hey, look, we do things that this way because we think that this is what's right because this aligns community to us, right? So on that front, uh, let's say that, so look, I think I think let's agree to the fact that every company has a certain top quartile for performers and certain bottom quartile performers, right? Regardless of the department that they're in, regardless of what they do, right? So if I were to just bunch, group a bunch of people into, hey, you're the top performers and you're not, right? 
how would you how do you as a company right especially being in a very remote scenario how do you bridge the gap between both of them how do you uh, try reducing i mean what do you, what's your root cause analysis essentially like like how do you go about fixing that and then translating that into an org wide practice and you know also improving the velocity of your own organization yeah um so i, I think part of that begins just with the way that we hire um and and one of our um um you know one of the big things that we look for in in any person that we're hiring is um you know are are they continuous learners like are they willing to um to continue um you know growing without you know being focused on um or or without you know specific guidance all the time on on what they need to do um so you know when you're talking about performance and you know addressing okay like some people are naturally higher performers than others and and that's normal um in some cases you know that's not so much of a bad thing i mean um you know there are always like a variety of, of you know there's a variety of different work right. that needs to be done um and and you know some you know some people are naturally going to take on certain things and others might take on other things um so I think starting out with the idea that okay no one goes to work with the goal of being a poor performer right like that's um not not typically what most people think about when they when they go to work <laughs> um so I, I think having that mindset going into kind of talking about performance um you know kind of establishes this baseline of of understanding and um and a desire to partner with people who are maybe um you know, not at the level that, you know, is expected of them or, or even the level that they want to be at. Um, uh, and, and from there, then you're able to say, okay, well, you know, what is actually going on? Um, and, and that kind of happens through, you know, the continuous feedback that I, um, you know, talked about with, within right. the context of, of onboarding. Um, but I, I think the other big thing that, um, is really important to us, at least at Duist, is radical candor um, and uh, really being willing to kind of address the elephant in the room or the, um, you know, the things that are difficult to talk about sometimes. Um, and and when you have a culture of, of trust where people know, like, okay, we're all here, um, you know, to support each other and to pursue this mission together, um, you know, anything that happens um that's misaligned with that then is something that um you know should be addressed and, and something that people um you know addressing shouldn't be seen as like a you know it's not a personal attack or um you know or, or something that's being done in, with ill intent it's just that um we all want to be you know successful and, and thriving together um so when there is you know someone who's struggling in terms of their performance um you know being able then to talk with them and and that all you know may typically happen with their manager um but it could also happen with you know a peer if, if they you know notice something um and and being able to kind of have that open conversation of okay like this hasn't been going as expected um you know let's talk about why that is um and it's amazing when you approach it that way because um you know sometimes the issue is outside of work sometimes it is at work but um you're able to really understand where that person is coming from and um and to you know be able to kind of pinpoint the source of that problem um and then be able to like have a productive conversation about you know what you need to do to to correct course and to um to kind of repair that performance because um sometimes you know it is a matter of you know, a misaligned expectation, like they thought that this is what was being asked of them or, or, or that this was um, what was being um, requested and, and, you know, and, and the reality is very different. Um, but being able to, to have that continuous loop makes the difference because, um, you know, I think that, like if you have a very traditional perspective on performance where, you know, maybe you have a six month and a 12 month um, you know, performance review. Um, by the time you're talking about performance at that point, uh, you know, it, it, you've already like yeah, allowed it just makes a no lot sense, of right? The, right. <laughs> like the, 
yeah the the issues have have already been been going on for a long time and that person has never had a chance to correct you know correct course um but when you have that continuous loop you can you know call things out very quickly um right. as early as you see them and, and sometimes it's a simple fix like hey like you know try doing this in the future um and sometimes it is deeper and, and needs more time to to be corrected um but i think by you know a addressing those things as early as they come up and then um kind of maintaining that partnership between manager and, and employee um you know you're you're able to to kind of move forward in a productive way that that you know helps people naturally grow um you know and, and then at the end of the day as long as everyone is um you know as long as everyone's performance is a is in an upward trajectory like that's um ultimately of benefit to them and to the company as a whole makes a lot of sense yeah so um before you know i sort of ask you a follow up uh, you know the next question on this i sort of want to address the elephant in the room again here which is the fact that hey a lot of people aren't good at addressing the elephants in the room by themselves uh while we may think that look this is something natural that everybody should be good at this but i think a lot of managers aren't and that naturally leads in politics and favoritism and a bunch of things and let's again address the elephant in the room by what is really getting boring at this point in time but yes uh you know uh this is what's been happening across organizations and i've seen this happening at scales as well right so uh you know so we could approach this two ways right you could you could just give us an example of how you know we go about let's say contrasting or giving perspectives and sort of trying to address the elephant in the room with somebody with probably a subordinate or a peer for example or you and i could do a role play here as well i don't mind doing that just to for just for the benefit of the audience you know to show them a live example of how it's really done sure. uh what would you prefer um I can I can walk you through like a, a situation yeah. that has sounds good yeah that has come up so right. I mean you know and, and I think what you said about the managers struggling with this sometimes it's definitely even at Duis like we've had had these conversations of okay like um, this person why do you is think struggling. this happens though I mean why do you think managers are so apprehensive about really bringing out constructive feedback I mean come on hey we're not we're not connected to each other we're not related to each other we might as well just say something hey look you know I know you're not trying to do I, I know I know you definitely not trying to sabotage the project but there's certain things that have come up from your peers that have been really working with well. and these are the five things why do you think this is so hard for people psychologically yeah um it's you know I, I think it comes down to the fact that addressing performance can feel like a very personal thing so when you're you know when if someone is you know underperforming and you need to address that with them it can feel like a personal attack and and even though you know that's not what it is like a lot of people feel like they're um personally attacking that person because you know they're on the team to do this work and by telling them like hey you're not doing well or like this isn't this isn't going as as planned and of course you would never like say it that way but um it feels like you know you're you're kind of putting into question their their expertise or their um their experience and and their value um but i one of the things that i always you know tell managers in in those situations is um to focus on the behavior itself not the person um and, and that's something that at duist is very um i mean the amount of of care that we have for each other as as people is so huge on the team and and i think that makes it a lot easier in many cases um because then you can go in and say like you know i'm you know like i care about you and i see that you're struggling with this or that um and i want to see you be successful in 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 this situation um and and and, and when you kind of go in with that openness i think that changes the tone of the conversation um and i guess specifically um being able to to acknowledge the fact with with managers that um you know when you're addressing poor performance you're not attacking the person but um you're correcting course for them that um is going to help them in the long run right because if someone isn't performing well like that hurts them and it hurts the company so um you know because they're under the impression that what they're doing is fine and um and that it's uh 
you know, and, and that maybe, you know, maybe they're under the impression that they're, um, you know, that they're growing and that they're, you know, kind of performing for performing really well when in reality, um, you know, it's maybe not so much the case. Um, but yeah, it is a, um, you know, a, it, it's something that takes time. Like, I think each manager has their own, um, you know, depending on their personality and the amount of experience they've had with um, with addressing those situations. Um, it just takes time to, um, to really get comfortable with, um, with framing those conversations and um, with kind of finding a productive path forward. Makes a lot of sense, yeah. So you, you know, in, in the previous, um, uh, you know, just before we, we talked about this, right, you mentioned two themes that really stood out to me. One was continuous learning, the way that you hire people. Uh, right. So the other one was, again, in terms, uh, I mean, it was sort of a flip side to what is what I was trying to ask you is that succession planning, right? How do you, because you mentioned shadowing, you mentioned a bunch of these things. Mm-hmm. And I think su- succession planning is also a very crucial aspect in terms of how you really enable people to improve if they haven't been performing up to the mark, right? And so, you know, to, I mean, I sort of agree to the fact that, hey, time spent at work, let's say if I clock in eight hours, on a daily basis, that does not really essentially equal to experience gained in the field. And given the fact that you've continuously emphasized on the fact that, hey, Doist enables everybody to really win, like you win as a team, I want you to win. You've sort of got that attitude with you guys, right? Which is brilliant, which is so rare to find. But then let's also face the fact that, hey, experience does not really mean that I'm spending eight hours in a day, that's not really enough. So how does Doist really help its employees across functions maximize the learning cycles in terms of the experience that, hey, if I'm completing this project to you, how much have we have really learned out of it? I mean, do you have a re- retrospective meeting of sorts that sort of help you reflect on the kind of learnings that have been there as a team, as individuals? And then again, how do you translate this learning culture on the, on the job, right? On the job learning essentially is what I'm pointing at. How do you translate that across, you know, uh, yourself, across the entire organization to follow, you know, to essentially just win where it matters and you because you mentioned Radical Candor as well, and that's one of the most fantastic books written on career and management. I think I really mm-hmm. feel that a lot of people should have it on the shelves. Uh, I have it on my Kindle. Uh, so, uh, but what I'm trying to say that, hey, you know, I think this is also very important that, you know, in terms of success, if I took, if I take any part of the thing, right, learning cycles really matter because I don't necessarily have to wait a year to get promoted. I can start doing the bigger projects right now itself. So how does Doist enables its 90 employees across 33 countries do this? Yeah, um, that has been one of the most important things that we've had to develop within the company. And it's so deeply ingrained in our culture because, I mean, one of our core values is mastery. So um, so that, you know, as I said, like it, it starts from hiring the right people who are um, kind of have that desire intrinsically to, um, to learn and to grow and that, you know, they're not just you know, they're not looking for a title, they're, they're looking to actually develop skills and grow in their career. Um, and, and in a way, like the, the way the company is set up has kind of, um, you know, it makes that a necessity because there isn't a ton of, um, you know, we don't have many levels and, um, and as a team that hires, hires pretty conservatively, like we're, um, you know, you, you're not going to be promoted to a managerial position in a year like it um you know usually those you know we have you know a set number of managers um you know maybe in the future we'll add more but basically your only opportunity for growth is um to grow in your role right and to to develop gain deeper experience and um and of course for the company to reward that as as it becomes um as it comes to fruition um, so with mastery in mind, then, um, you know, we have a number of things that we do to, to invest in, in people's growth and, and, and learning. Um, so the first thing, like just as a very simple um, foundational um, kind of support is uh, um, everyone has a, a growth budget to, um, to use to invest in books, um, courses, conferences, like anything that they um, you know, want to do to, to kind of upscale or, um, to, to grow in, in particular professional areas. Um, so that's like a very simple, like, you know, provide a, a budget to, to be able to do that. Um, 
uh, you know, and, and of course that kind of gives back in terms of the, the expertise that they bring to their role, um, to the work that they do in the company. Um, the other thing that we've actually been building for <laughs> a number of years and we finally kind of executed on last year was uh, an em employee growth framework. Um, so to really operationalize what growth looks like within the company. Um, and that's still kind of, you know, in continuous development, but, um, you know, kind of defining what, you know, growth looks like and, and how to get to those, um, you know, how to grow, um, you know, from one level to the next uh, in the company. Um, and what that has done is um, it's kind of created a great, um, again, reinforces the, the partnership between manager and employee um, to be able to kind of meet each year and say, okay, like what goals do you have, um, you know, in terms of your professional development this year um, in your role? Like, what do you want to do? Um, or what, what's, you know, what are particular areas that interest you that you want to grow in? Um, and so they're able to kind of collaborate to set those goals. And then, um, you know, each person's manager is there as a support to, um, you know, to connect them with people that might be able to help them to, um, to help them kind of strategize how they're going to approach that. Um, if there's an opportunity within, um, you know, the work that's being done in the on the team to actually like introduce some of those opportunities into the work, then, um, you know, they can do that. Um, but it really helps focus every, everyone to, to, you know, pick one or two goals to, um, to really um, go deep on. Um, another thing that we started doing about a year ago um, is that every person on the team actually gets to invest um, you know, some time for the duration of a month to um, to work on a project within the company that they want. Um, so they get to propose a project and, and this could be related to their development goal um, or it could just be, you know, again, something else that they're um, interested in, in building um, that's, you know, going to challenge them in some way professionally or, or technically. Um, and they get to spend a month building that or, or developing that. Um, and that sometimes produces, you know, things that benefit the whole company in terms of, um, you know, something that we're going to end up using continuously after that. Um, and sometimes it's just like a good experiment of um, something that could inspire a future, um, you know, initiative within the company. Um, and then very generally, um, just, you know, creating space for knowledge sharing within the team. Um, whether it is, um, you know, retrospectives on, um, you know, a project that has been done. Um, maybe it's just general knowledge that someone has, um, you know, something someone has learned that they want to share with other people on the team um, and have a discussion about. Um, and then we've also started doing kind of these internal live talks where, um, you know, people can discuss topics that they're interested in. and. Um, kind of do a, a presentation and open discussion about about those things. Um, so I think in general, just the more that you're able to integrate learning and collaboration and, um, you know, and, and these opportunities to, you know, to, to kind of challenge yourself within within the day to day work. Um, it really makes a big difference in, um, you know, helping people kind of maintain that mindset that you know, I'm, I'm constantly seeking growth. I'm, I'm always looking for ways to improve, um, for ways to challenge myself in my work um, and to be able to use those various resources to, to, to make that possible. Thank you. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, I'd like to ask, this one question on um, you know in this one is pretty much about um, you know how how you deal with people the kind of feedback you give them etc but I think uh, the one thing that's intrinsic to every organization is understanding their culture right and also you know creating something that's larger than the organization itself uh, especially in a remote organization 
because uh, you don't want people to feel like you know um, they're working out of their home or you know their home office space you still want them to belong somewhere um so you know and and that sense of belonging is much larger than their their particular role uh, but i think it's also a sense of purpose so uh, how how uh, you know have you folks come up with this 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 feeling that i belong despite the fact that you know i may not really go to Uh, you know four walls really to belong right or or yeah. you know go to a building to belong because a bunch how, of people have also uh, uh, been know, speaking about that? yeah because a bunch of people on twitter have also been talking about you know there's no replacement for a water cooler yet no matter how many games and how many uh, slack bots they've been man- they managed to build in the pandemic right so uh, just adding on yeah um you know i i think that has been one of the biggest challenges for i mean it's one of the biggest challenges for any team to face is how to create um you know that culture and that company identity that um everyone can connect to regardless of um you know the context of the company whether they're co-located whether they're hybrid remote um and it is especially difficult as a remote company because um and i, I always talk about this because I think when you have a co-located team you have a physical space to help kind of create that culture um and that identity because you go in you know you 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 see like the you know the design of the building you see the, um you know different things on the wall that speak to your like mission or your values um there's a lot of um a lot of things that are done to help kind of reinforce whatever it is that team is you know whatever that team believes in or whatever they do um but when you're remote it's all virtual right and it can almost feel like i don't know it, it feels kind of like something that you can it, it's always just like right outside of reach um and, and i think the way to you know the way that we've been able to address that um is first by being very explicit about what we're what we're trying to accomplish so like being very clear about the mission um what we're you know what we're all here to do um and and i always like i love the way that our website is designed because it really puts this front and center um but take a look at it once when you have a chance but you know right at the top of our of our website like the very first thing you see is building the future we want to work in um which you know is such a grand vision um to have um and for us that is like a remote first um organization that um you know is async first and um you know that values people not just for what they contribute to the company but um for being who they are and um and acknowledging that they have you know very complex lives outside of work um and that all of those things are valuable um so i think being very clear about what you believe in up front um is the biggest thing that any company has to do um and you know and it's very easy for for any company to to kind of put words on a wall or to put words on a web page and then to do nothing but i think that's where um you know you you take your company values you take your mission and your vision and um and all of these things drive everything you do um you know they drive everything from the the products you develop the work that you do on a day-to-day basis um and the way that you interact and the way that you develop policies like it just has to be um the red thread that runs through anything in the company like if i go look at anything that we're working on or anything that we've written um it all has to align with with what we believe in um and i think that's something that a lot of companies struggle with um and even we do too like it's i mean i'm i'm not <laughs> we haven't figured it out by any means like we're we're still you know continuously learning and challenging ourselves to um to be better about this because um but i think what makes the difference is that um if you have this continuous focus of okay any decision that we make has to be aligned with our values so um you know as we're developing a solution to something we're saying like okay does this match um what we value does this match what we believe in um and if it does then great like 
you know, you move forward and you develop a plan. If not, then, you know, there isn't even a question of whether you should implement it or not because it, it doesn't align. Um, and I think when you have that consistency, um, people learn, you know, you, you create a culture where people really trust, you know, they trust the company, they trust each other um, because they know that, um, that there is so much care and, and attention being given to how um, everything is done and how decisions are made. Um, and that if something is done that, you know, either the company outgrows or maybe you realize down the line that, hey, like this doesn't really, you know, this doesn't really match our values or it kind of contradicts on this front, then you can say, oh, okay, yeah, that's, you know, that's true. Like, let's dig into that more and, and let's, um, you know, figure out how we can approach this differently so that, um, so that it, it is consistent and it is aligned. Um, and, and then what you have is, you know, over time and, and continuously your, um, you know, who you say you are as a company actually matches what you do on a daily basis. Um, and, and that is probably the most important thing that any company has to, um, you know, has to be able to reach and, and be able to, to do. Got it. Uh, it's actually, I mean, you know, um, off plate actually just, just probably, you know, uh, in India right now, we, you know, we seem to have the second wave and um, things seem like, you know, they probably were settling in and people expected to go back mm -hmm. to work. Um, however, I think that entire thing kind of just suddenly, you know, vanished and people again, it feels like, you know, we're living 2020 again, right, with all its uncertainties. Um, so what I'm trying to ask you, Andrew, is how, how, how do you deal with this kind of uncertainty, you know, because um, it's, it's not easy, right? And, and uh, you know, there is a lot of also, I'm sure that, you know, there's some kind of fatigue and anxiety also in people, right? Um, so what did the pandemic really teach you that, you know, you were not prepared for? Because you folks have, have always been remote first, you know, and I always believe that an organization that is remote first has a lot of answers to questions because they're preempted, right? You know that these are the possible use cases. What happens in the world when you can't preempt these use cases? Yeah, um, you know, and that is a, that's a really good question. Um, it's kind of interesting because the experience that we've had at Duist um, while, of course, you know, being in 30 different countries, people are all struggling with their own things, you know, they've experienced the pandemic differently, you know, maybe they know people who have, who have, who have gotten sick, or maybe they themselves have gotten sick. Um, so everyone is kind of dealing with different things, and, um, and that can be a very difficult thing to navigate. Um, but what's interesting is that because we have been remote first, you know, since the company started, um, we were almost in a way prepared to deal with some of this uncertainty because, um, you know, just naturally the way that we work has always been focused on, you know, giving everyone flexibility to work on their own terms. Um, and, and so I guess the difference then is that you know, over the past year, people's struggles have been have been a lot bigger than usual. They've, um, you know, and and of course, remote work during the pandemic, it, like it's been said many times, but it has to constantly be repeated that remote work during a pandemic is not rem the way remote work is designed to work. Um, you know, you you don't have like it's kind of funny when people to ask us like, you know, well, you are already remote. So, you know, everything is normal for you, right? And I'm like, I mean, in a way, yes, like we haven't, you know, we haven't had to fully restructure anything um, to to meet the needs of, of you know, the current circumstances, um, which is a huge privilege and, and not something that, that can be taken for granted. But, um, but it is different and it is challenging because you really don't have the same flexibility that you would have had before where, um, you know, you have a lot of things that, you know, are part of your life and a lot of things that are 
contributing to your ability to stay balanced and to, to maintain your mental health and, um, and to, you know, to be able to thrive at work. And so, um, you know, the, the biggest thing that can be done in those circumstances is, um, first of all, to take a people first approach, which should always be the case, you know, pandemic or not, um, you know, to really think about what people need at any time and, and acknowledge that, okay, like, you know, yes, people come to work and they want to, you know, and they want to do something meaningful and, um, and that, that is important. And, and that is in a way its own source of, of uh, control during this time is that people still are able to, um, to do the things that they, you know, to use their gifts to, to contribute to a bigger purpose. Um, but acknowledging that their lives outside of work, um, you know, don't stop and, and that things are always going on. Um, and that that is naturally going to influence their work, it's going to influence their performance. Um, and so kind of approaching all of that with a level of grace and, and understanding that, you know, you're not going to get people's best performance during their, this time, like it's just not, not feasible, it's not realistic. Um, you know, and, and as a company, like that should be kind of the, you know, at the forefront of, of their, their thought is how do we support the team right now? Not, you know, how do we, you know, exceed our, our, uh, you know, financial goals for, for this quarter or, or this year or whatever. Um, the other thing that kind of worked in our favor that I think many companies have started talking about more, um, you know, over the past year is um, asynchronous first communication. Um, so kind of not just being remote, and, and of course, right now you're kind of forced to be remote, but um, not just working remotely, but also giving people freedom to um, to control their schedule and the way that, you know, when they work and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I think that's one of the, you know, in a year marked by, you know, a general loss of control over, a lot of things in our lives, um, giving people the courtesy of, of, you know, having control over how they manage the, their schedule to the extent that they can, um, is a really big thing. Um, you know, it's, it's probably the most valuable thing you could give someone, you know, in, in this, um, you know, it, given the current circumstances is to be able to say like, okay, you know what, like, if, if you are not at your best during this time, um, then don't work right now. Like work when you are at your best, you know? Like, um, you know, if you're not a morning person, don't start work at eight, like start at 10, if that will make you feel better. And, um, you know, and and do what you need to do to to be able to, to, to you know, be as best as you can be. Um, and then the, the last thing that, you know, to, to answer like a very specific part of your question that um, maybe surprised us over the past year is that um, when you empower your team, especially in difficult times, um, it's amazing how they'll step up to to meet different needs and to come up with creative solutions. Um, you know, over the past year, one of the biggest challenges has been that like social connection aspect of things. Um, you know, we had plans um, last April um, to to meet up in in Singapore um, for our annual company retreat, and of course, um, you know those plans had to be canceled and um, and put on hold. And you know we have our fingers crossed for uh, September 2021, um, and and of course we still don't know what will happen. Um, but over the past year, that need to kind of connect has been greater than ever. Um, and being able to see how, you know, people didn't just um, reduce this to like, oh, this is like people ops's responsibility to, to do, but everyone, you know, people have, have gone out of their ways countless times to create opportunities for connection, whether, um, you know, whether it's like, you know, engaging in our social channels, you know, where people just talk about their interests and, and uh, you know, creating those connections or having, um, you know, sometimes where people just jump on a, a you know, on video chat um, and work together, you know, they maybe aren't even 
talking, but they're just there like together and, um, you know, and, and kind of have that chance to see people and to, to you know, have a good conversation um, and, and to feel like they're kind of in each other's presence, um, you know, and, and, and just generally to, you know, extend each other a bit more grace than, you know, than maybe we, we did before um, and understanding that, you know, things come up, maybe, you know, we'll have people that, you know, suddenly like have, you know, less restrictions in their area and, you know, they, they're going to take a week off now to enjoy the fact that they can actually like leave their homes and, and do things. Um, so just being like flexible to, to, to let people kind of do what they need to do during this time to, to, to be as healthy as they can be. Um, and it's difficult, right? It requires sacrifice. It requires um, a willingness to kind of release control that, you know, for many companies is so important to them. Um, but when you do empower people and, and you entrust them with, um, with all of that, like it always, you know, it comes back and, and it, you know, it benefits the person, the individual and, um, and the company as a whole. The only reason I ask that is because we really live in uncertain times, right? And uh, um, even within the boundaries of remote first, or, you know, going, being fully remote, we're really not living that. We're living mm -hmm. the pandemic remote, you know, right. which, is, which is quite different, I see. And therefore, cutting people's slack, I think, and, and being empathetic as an organization is, is really important. But uh, I think the last question really from me is that, how did you change, um, you know, your measure of productivity? Therefore, right? Um, did you did you still continue to measure it the way you always did, or did you kind of, you know, uh, say that hey, let's let's just take a relook at this aspect and and you know account for certain things that are not the norm? Um, I'd, I'd, I'd really be interested in understanding how did you accommodate uh, for a, maybe empathy a little bit or you know, just let um, it be a little bit. Yeah, um, I guess the, the way that we measure performance, and maybe I, I wasn't like very clear about this before, but um, at least up until now, like our measure of performance is really mostly focused on whether people are aligned with, you know, with our values or not. Like, is that coming through in their work? Like, do they show responsiveness to feedback and, and um, do they show alignment with our values in, in the work that they do? Um, and, and that, you know, maybe in a way seems like a very simplistic way of, of boiling things down. Um, but I think what it does accomplish is that, you know, when you do have that team that you've hired that are very intrinsically motivated, are driven individually to, to you know, to excel and to grow, um, you know, when, when you do have like these circumstances where, um, you know, where, where people, you know, just aren't going to, to, to be as productive as they were before. Um, you know, it's not a matter of, of, you know, how much they're producing. It's that they, you know, it's that they are like showing that commitment to what they're doing and, um, that they're communicating openly when, when they don't, um, you know, when they can't do something. Um, and so like, you know, like it's always about, you know, quality over quantity and, and, and that is, um, you know, that is ultimately what, what makes the difference. And, and I think that may be where a lot of companies might see things differently where, you know, their, their measure of performance is maybe more focused on production or on, you know, how much time someone is spending at work or whatever it is. And, and of course, these are like definitely not, you know, not measures of success. Like, I mean, they are, you know, they are measuring something, but, you know, I, I could produce, you know, a hundred times the work I'm doing now and, and not have the same quality, but is that really adding value then um, versus someone who is taking the care and time to, um, to do, you know, high quality work, even if it's less than, they were producing before, but knowing that they are still, um, you know, that they're still invested, that they're still contributing what they can, um, and that they're communicating, you know, 
when they are in a place where, you know what, like I'm, I'm burnt out right now. Like I, you know, maybe they, they take time off or maybe they're just, um, you know, their, their circumstances just aren't conducive to, to, you know, being at like top production level that they would normally be at. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of transparency, a lot of, um, willingness to accept that, you know, that as a company, we're not going to execute as much as we, we could be for, but the fact that we can focus on, on, you know, on some things and, and kind of support the team in, in working on those things together, um, definitely like, you know, it adds a lot of value and it, it helps give people something to, to almost distract them from, um, from like the difficult things they might be dealing with outside of work. Yeah, no, that sounds very interesting. So you were saying? Yeah, uh, so I was just saying that uh, surprisingly, I was just uh, talking to, you know, I mean, we have a couple of uh, check-ins at work and, uh, you know, I, 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 I just felt like, you know, my sense of belonging to the organization has actually gone mm -hmm. up. Uh, you know, more than I ever felt when I visited, you know, the office. And, and I think uh, it's only because of the factors that you really mentioned. Uh, and I think transparency and the whole fact of being able to open up. And, and I think it's, it's a very human and humane period, this one, you know. Mm -hmm. So in a way, if we can, if we can um, continue being this transparent and continue being this humane, I think we will really remember this period for that. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, I, I've seen a lot of, you know, I've seen both like great examples and, and you know, really bad examples of companies like approaching this. And, and, and I think what a lot of companies fail to realize is that right now they, they don't need to try to replicate their co-located culture in a remote context like that isn't that isn't the solution right like it's right now like they've been given i mean i guess they they haven't been given they've been forced to have an opportunity to to reinvent the way that they do things and the way they work and, and treat people um and so you know especially for companies where you know there may be more formal you went to an office and there was like a clear separation between work and life um, you know, now being able to say like, you know, you, you jump on a call with people and, uh, and, and of course at Duist for us, this is normal, but for other companies, maybe, you know, you jump on a video call with someone and, you know, you see their messy living room or you, their kids, you know, running around or whatever it is. And, and, and it's a very humanizing experience, as you said, and, and it, it, it should lead to greater empathy and greater understanding and 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 just uh you know being able to like celebrate and enjoy the fact that you know what when we go to work we don't you know like we don't like turn off part of who we are like you know like it's it's like we are our, we should be able to be our full selves no matter you know whether we're at work whether we're outside of work and and realize that that does actually add value even to work where, you know, it, the, the mindset might be that, oh, like this is a professional setting. Like we, you know, can't talk about these things. And, um, and of course, like, you know, there's, you know, professionalism is important, but um, to realize that like being able to bring your full self to work, um, the good and the bad and, and like everything you're experiencing is, um, is the only way to allow the workplace to become more human. Um, so companies that, you know, that, that realize that and, and have become more open to this, I think are, are the ones that are becoming more empathetic and more people centric in the way that they're, um, that they work and develop policies and, um, and, and build their culture as a whole. Sounds interesting. Andrew, so you shared a bunch of things that I think would be really helpful to your audience. And, and, and uh, you know, one of the things that I'd like to sort of uh, give an open shout out to is kind of work they've done on your website. Uh, I think Duos is something that I think every website, every company out there should really benchmark in terms of how to communicate your policies, 
how to sort of essentially draw the lines, even if you're a small but profitable company that's saying that, hey, look, you know, uh, for example, you know, I, I'd really like to just screen share and really uh, show the fantastic work that you guys have done, right? And I think it's important to sort of highlight, especially this fact that, hey, you, you've openly told that you're trying to build the future work. And, and one of the things I think that's really, uh, I think worth emphasizing the fact that the, you know, the uh, mission statement that you've highlighted here, which is that you're trying to really inspire the, the workplace of the future, trying to, you know, set an example. And I think that's immediately highlighted the fact that, hey, you don't think in terms of uh, days, you don't think in terms of quarters, you think in terms of decades. In fact, um, an anecdote that I sort of came across some time back was uh, about that Italians especially don't measure businesses in terms of quarters, they measure businesses in terms of generations. And that really stuck by me for quite some time. And I think... Yeah. And, and, and really speaking as well, I think if every company really wants to see it survive the pandemic and see it do all of those things, I think it's very important that they think very long. I think Sam Altman as well, you know, one, uh, you know, one of my combinators investors also uh, wrote an essay on this that, you know, the days are long, but the decades are really short. And before you know it, you're either the next unicorn or you're just building something else. You, you've given up on this and you've done that, right? Uh, so circling back to everything that you've shared, if, if, if let's say if I'm the CEO, if I'm somebody, if I walk into the room right now, and if I ask you for your recommendation, something that you would just want to summarize and give them to from your insights, what would that be? Mm. I guess I, 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 I've said this multiple times, but I, I mean, it, it really speaks to how important it is. Um, but, you know, filtering everything you do through your core values is one of the most important things that a, a company can do that alongside um you know really focusing on the people and empowering them to um to be who they are and to to bring the value that they have to the company um and, and that i think can be very difficult because it does require a lot of trust and a lot of releasing of control that a lot of leaders feel like they need to have um, but for example, like at Duist, you know, no one knows when people are working and when they're not. Like, I mean, you can see when people are responding to messages because, you know, like responded one minute ago. So, you know, they're okay. They're yeah, probably online, online yeah. but there's no like online status. There's no, um, there's no like control over, you know, like, you know, there's no time tracking. There's no, you know, keystroke tracking. There's you know, no requirement to stay on video all day during work, as I've heard some companies do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Especially so, some companies have actually gone to the extent of installing some weird form of tracking software and whatnot yeah. on the computers, which is, I, I don't know, I mean, if it's proxy for mass surveillance or something, but it's really creepy at this yeah. point of time. <laughs> yeah, so, so you know, the, the trust that you extend to your team and to the people that you're entrusting to, to carry the company forward, uh, is going to reflect in in the commitment that you have and the engagement that people have with the company um and and in their you know in retention overall like people who feel valued who feel trusted to you know and and that are treated as adults because they are adults um are going to feel that strong connection to what you, what you're doing and what you're accomplishing together um and, and so you know, really focusing on those things, the values and the people, um, and then translating that into, um, you know, into everything that you do um, is going to, I mean, it can't not be successful, right? Because at the end of the day, you're empowering people that are likely far more equipped than you are to, to carry the company's mission forward to, to, to actually do so. Um, yeah, it's it, it it seems very simplistic, but um, not enough companies do it, and right. um, and it shows in the way that people talk about their work and in in the way that people generally see their company. It takes a super holistic approach to really see through the end. Uh, so yeah, Nisha had to drop off by the way because of internet issues again, which is oh. very evident because of remote working and all of these things. In fact, um, just to add one last thing, Apple actually came up with this super nice commercial, which I'm definitely going to link in the description and everything of this podcast as well. Uh, it was again around work and how messy and everything is, and I'm a huge fan of everything that Apple does, especially the kind of message that they bring out. And I think that's worth checking out alongside, uh, you know, the, on your priority list, check out Do's website first, replicate what they're doing, take notes from them, 
they they're the best in the industry no doubt about that so um and again thanks a lot for being on the podcast the kind of notes that you've shared with us isn't really i think pretty sure a lot of companies and a lot of you know your counterparts in across the globe will really want to uh listen to this and really take notes from everything that you've said and it's been a fantastic experience uh nigram apologies that nisha had to drop off as well but uh you know remote you know you know how it is at home yeah uh, <laughs> technology yeah, issues so. come up it's it, part you know, of the experience <laughs> I, i know right i mean we've, we've mastered to go to space uh you know all the way to mars right now Elon's yeah. got you know uh, retractable rockets, but we still can't fix up our internet issue across the globe. I don't know what's going on. That's yeah. one, one of those things. Uh, anyway, Andrew, uh, I look forward to speaking with you again and definitely interacting with you and sharing uh, you know your insights again with the community, probably via fireside chats that we plan to have as well. Um, for the listeners of this podcast, we're going to be back next week as well with another exciting episode as usual. And uh, stay tuned, keep rocking, and have uh, you know again go through all the episodes. Reach out to me, Andrew, and everybody. Uh, Andrew's uh, details are going to be provided as well. Feel free to drop him a note on LinkedIn or anywhere else you might. Uh, Andrew might be okay with sharing. Uh, so, anyway, thanks a lot for listening. Have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>